Hertz has got it, wants to throw. Hertz setting up the screen. It is complete and blown up. Miles Sanders caught it. Malcolm Rodriguez was there waiting for him. That's a big play by Rodrigo. Welcome to the 20 Minute in the Huddle podcast presented by Microsoft. This is the post bye week edition of the podcast. And as always, we start with news and notes. And, and you know, the bye week is, is a good time um, to, you know, reflect on the first, you know, set of games, uh, to do some self-evaluation, do some scheme stuff. Um, and, it, it, you know... It, Usually teams like that buy to come, you know, week eight, week nine, week 10, kind of split the season up. The Lions got an early buy this week, but I think it just came at a perfect time for them. You know, obviously at one and four, not the start they want. Um, you know, they're reeling a little bit um, after, you know, a 29 nothing loss to New England. They've dealt with a ton of injuries on that front. It, it came at a good time. And I just think it, it gave them an opportunity to step back, do a little self-reflection and, and you know, try to set the, the reset button, um, you know, for this 12 game stretch because look they've got to come out fire now they've put themselves in a hole and you know they got to dig themselves out of it or you know they're not gonna be playing meaningful games in December and that's certainly not what any Lions fan wants especially with some of the expectations going into this season and really with how well offensively they've played football so you know the defense obviously needs to to you know get some things squared away but you know I think the news and notes always has to start with injuries you know like I mentioned you know they were really banged up um, going into the bye um, yeah they're still kind of banged up if you look at the injury report from from Wednesday and, and Thursday this week I mean they're still dealing with some stuff you know uh, it's not looking great for DJ Chark and, and that's a big loss for them I mean he was obviously that that X receiver that guy that they needed to, to really kind of finish off that offense w- w- with what they had and you you know, Quintus Cephas then goes down. So you're kind of missing that dynamic X guy that can, you know, make plays outside the numbers, get down the field. And so Ben Johnson's had been had to be creative a little bit with kind of what what they've done missing um, DJ. Um, I'm worried a little bit about Josh Reynolds. He's a guy that stepped up in, in place of DJ, but if you watch that New England game, I mean, he was really playing through some pain at the end of that game. He showed up with a knee injury, didn't practice Wednesday. So, um, you know, we're, we're just going to kind of see where that goes. If you don't have Chark and you don't have Reynolds, I think that's a big loss for this offense. I mean, the great news is DeAndre Swift looks like he's trending toward playing. He talked to us um, on Wednesday, said that's the goal. He returned to practice. Great news. And, and Amon Ross St. Brown was a full participant in practice Wednesday. He's been dealing with that high ankle sprain and so to get him back and to get Swift back that's obviously huge now if you can get Reynolds too and you have a presence outside on that X spot you know I think you know you feel pretty good about Detroit's chances uh, to go down there and score some points in Dallas on Sunday you know speaking of, of Dallas you know I think looking at that game, there's there's a great opportunity for like a strength on strength moment in that game. Um, you look at their defense and their front seven, it's, it, it's really been the catalyst of, of their team. And I've got John Mashoda on the, on a pod um, a little bit later. He's going to break down everything, you know, Dallas from the athletic and, and, you know, he does a great job. And, and he was talking about this, this defense and what he's seeing as, as being kind of historically good defensively. Um, so we'll get into that in a little bit, but, but you do look at their front seven and um you know they lead the nfl with 24 sacks mike parsons is obviously terrific but you know they've got four different guys with three plus sacks they've got 10 different guys with sacks it's not just the sacks it's the pressures too right and so they've been really good defensively and then when you look at the strength of detroit what's that been right they're they're offensive line, their ability to run the football and protect Jared Goff. Jared Goff's been sacked seven times this year. That's tied for the fewest in the league. So I think it'll be really fun to watch kind of Detroit's offensive line against Dallas's front seven. I think that's going to really be, you know, one of the keys to, to the game. And, and look, it's got to be a key for Detroit. Um, this offense has kind of got to get its groove back. You look at the first four weeks and just how explosive they were. And it was kind of a clunker in, in New England. You know, obviously you weren't with, you were without Swift. You were without I'm on Ross St. Brown. Bill Belichick's one of the best minds, defensive minds in football. And, and look, he took away um, TJ Hawkinson and, and made other guys beat you. And, and Detroit, what you know, didn't do that. They made some uncharacteristic mistakes up front, some miscommunication stuff, excuse me, with, with the offensive line. And so, um, 
Yeah, it was an uncharacteristic performance offensively. So yeah, I think this offense needs to get their groove back. I think the defense is still trying to figure things out. They're, they're changing personnel. I know Aaron Glenn talked this week about um, some defensive changes and, and some continuing personnel stuff th th that they plan to do until they kind of get that all squared away and we can start to see some progress on defense. This offense has got to score, and they've got to be good. They're, they're the best thing going for this team right now. They've got to get their groove back in Dallas. We'll see if they can. And... You know, the kicker situation, I think that's another one to watch. You know, they've got Michael Bagley, but, um, you know, didn't have a ton of confidence, you know, in, 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 in throwing him out there and, and um, you know, expecting him to make some kicks uh, against New England. Has that changed? They brought in Sam Ficken. You know, he's a guy who's kicked in this league too. So it could be another week where maybe you're still trying to figure out the kicking situation as well. So, you know, those are some news and notes. Like I said, I got John Machada, Machada from uh, The Athletic. Um, he's going to join me talking Cowboys. Frank Ragnow is going to come and we're going to talk about that Dallas front seven and, and Detroit strength. And obviously, you know, we, we do the key matchups every week. I got Mike O'Hara joining me this week so busy show all around Welcome back to the 20 in the Huddle podcast presented by Microsoft. I am joined by John Machado, who does a terrific job covering the Cowboys for the Athletic. John, thanks for joining me this morning. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me on. Well, let's start with obviously last week, you know, a tough loss, a, a big division game for, for you guys. We know what it's like losing a close game to the Philadelphia Eagles. You guys get another crack at them, fortunately. But, you know, anything jump out about that loss that, that lingers a week or, 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 or you guys moved on to Dallas and, and beyond that one? It's funny that you say that because uh, I, I feel like coming out of all these games, you know, fans and us analyzing this stuff, we should have this big you know, this is the reason that they lost. And, and there really isn't from that game. I mean, they lost because Cooper rushed through three interceptions, but I didn't come out of that game thinking anything differently of the Dallas Cowboys than I thought going in. Um, the, the Eagles are probably the best team in the NFC right now. Um, there's no fan base that hates the Cowboys more than the Eagles. Um, that's the toughest road environment. I've been covering a team since 2011. That's the toughest road environment I've seen them go into uh, a Sunday night game in Philadelphia. Uh, things are grow going great in Philly for for their sports teams. And, uh, you know, uh, they were having fun all day long and it was a perfect setting for them. And they didn't have Dak Prescott. So, uh, yeah, nothing nothing changed there. If Cooper Rush doesn't throw three interceptions, the Cowboys probably win that game anyway. You know, you mentioned Dak and, and obviously returned to practice this week, has a full throwing regimen. Do you expect him to be the quarterback under center Sunday? I do. I do. I mean. So before the Philadelphia game, he threw for about 20 minutes to receivers and uh, up through about 50 passes. And that was the first time that he really did something uh, to that level. And from what I saw, he looked like a guy that could go out there and yeah, he's might not be the Dak Prescott of a hundred percent, but I think he's good enough with how well this defense is playing to be able to win games at where he's at. And so they wanted to be a little bit cautious, give him an extra week. And that, and that makes sense, but yeah, there's no doubt in my mind, unless you know, they have a Thursday practice in a little bit. If, if he suffered some type of a setback or he just looked really bad, maybe something changes there. But I, I don't see that happen. I would be shocked if he wasn't their starter on Sunday. You know, obviously dealing with the thumb has been out for, what, over a month now. Is, is there any worry at all about rust when a guy's been out that long, especially at the quarterback position? It, it, you know, it's not like you're a receiver or a lineman or something like that. You can kind of jump in and get into the flow. I mean, is there any concern in, in Dallas about there being a little bit of rust? Well, yeah, and, and and particularly on the timing routes with just receivers and things like that, um, you know, it's one thing to throw on air uh, before a game, and it's another to be throwing uh, full speed uh, with a defense playing uh, to try and stop you. And, and as you know, these practices, they only give you so much. I mean, they had a walkthrough practice on Wednesday they, that Mike McCarthy calls a mock game, and then Dak was scheduled to throw after that again to receivers, probably another 50 passes. So this Thursday practice will be really tell you a lot because this will be the first time that he's getting a chance to kind of go live. So yeah, I, I anticipate some rust from him, but the thing that's changed since he's been out is their defense has stepped up and they've really uh, relied on that running game because they had to. And I think that as they ease him back in, I think that's, they're going to stick with that plan. And it's not going to be the Dak Prescott of the last few years where you're like, well, if the Cowboys are going to win, he's probably gonna have to throw 35, 40 times. I, I don't get the sense out of, out of, out of that coming from the team right now. 
that's been a really nice duo in the backfield I, with Ezekiel Elliott and Tony Pollard. Um, you know, obviously Zeke for so many years carried so much. There was so much, you know, kind of tread on the tires there. Um, but how how has that changed them a little bit? How has that made that offense better? That that Tony's now a bigger part of that backfield. It's been huge. I mean, he's been their biggest playmaker. You know, they're not going to give him twenty carries. Uh, and for a long time, that was Ezekiel Elliott's job. They'd give him the 20, 25 carries and they would lean on him and it led him to some good seasons. He had a couple of rushing titles, but it's changed over the years. He's taken a lot of wear and tear. So you've needed kind of somewhat similar to the situation that the Lions have where you have just two backs that kind of complement each other with the way they play. I think the biggest thing that's, that's allowed it to be successful is that there hasn't been any ego from Ezekiel Elliott about it. You know, you go from being the guy that that he was 2016 through probably 2019 and then all of a sudden you know they're talking more about a timeshare in the backfield and so uh, he's adapted pretty well to it Um, but in big moments when they need you know goal line uh, fourth and one things like that Ezekiel Elliott's still going to be their guy um, but his running style is just so different from Tony Pollard's that they've been able to complement each other pretty well. Well, we've got to talk about that Dallas defense, too. You mentioned it off the top, how that's been, you know, really a strength. You look at the 24 sacks that leads the NFL, and it's not just, you know, Micah Parsons. You, know, you look at Armstrong, you look at Dante Fowler, you look at, you know, Lawrence, obviously. As, you know, all those guys have three or more sacks. It really comes from all angles on Dallas. And I know talking with Dan Campbell, some of the offensive players this week in Detroit, you know, that's the thing that they talk about. It's not just – you obviously have to, have to know where, where Micah is, but you can't just focus it there because they're so talented just across their front seven. Just, you know, how good has that unit been? And, and how much of, of, you know, the four and two start for Dallas is because of that front seven defensively? Well, Tim, it's been wild just because of the fact of that for so long, the Cowboys have been in a team built around their offense. And uh, two particular moves are what swung it. And one was getting Dan Quinn as their defensive coordinator. And the other was, I mean, let's be honest, they got lucky to get Micah Parsons. I mean, (laughs) they didn't want Micah Parsons. They originally wanted one of the top cornerbacks in that draft, and both of them got picked right before the Cowboys went on the clock. So they traded back with, of all teams, the Eagles, and they get Micah Parsons, and we're thinking, okay, well, they drafted another, you know, like a Leighton Vander Esch-type linebacker who's going to be a traditional linebacker, and that hasn't been the case at all. And he's been just this monster pass rusher that there's multiple times for games where I just sit there thinking to myself, like, man, the Cowboys probably got lucky because of the COVID year that Micah sat out at Penn state, because if he plays another year at Penn state, I find it hard to believe that he wouldn't have taken another step. Not that he wasn't good before, but I think he plays another year there and I don't think he gets out of the top five. And so he's changed everything just because they can use him in so many different ways. Traditional linebacker, they can drop him into coverage. He can rush from either edge spot. He can, they rush him up the middle. Um, So there's just such a variety of things you can do with him. And, And he's just been so special early on that you generally don't see that stuff. And because there's so much focus on him, it just opens things for Demarcus Lawrence. And, and Dorrance Armstrong is another guy who he kind of he kind of didn't get a lot of attention the last couple of years because they had Randy Gregory. And then Randy Gregory signs in the offseason with the Broncos. So Dorrance gets more opportunities. And so that's been huge up front. And then, of course, on the back end, like everyone knows, Trayvon Diggs has been such a playmaker. And so having that pressure up front uh, gives him opportunities on, on that back end. But yeah, it all starts with Micah Parsons. You know, every week it's like, it's almost like the way with, with New England, how Bill Belichick, a lot of people talk about the greatness of Bill Belichick is that every week he can do something different. Well, Micah Parsons allows Dan Quinn that ability to, you just really don't know from week to week, even covering the team, how exactly is Micah Parsons going to be used? And what a credit to Quinn, really, in, in having the foresight to to be able to use him in, in, in so many different ways. We asked Dan Campbell um, on, on Wednesday about, you know, Micah, and obviously they scouted him. They ended up taking Penny Sewell at seven, and Micah falls, and, and, and Dallas gets him at 12. But, you know, Dan said, you know, the, the trouble with, you know, scouting Micah was where were you going to play him? Was he a stacked linebacker? Was he an outside linebacker? Was he just a guy that you could put throw on the edge? And so there was kind of that mystery with what you were going to do with him. You, you knew he was an athlete. You knew he was a, a a, you know, terrific physical talent, but how are you going to use them? So what, what a great job Dan Quinn and the Cowboys have done and of just really identifying all the things he can do and, and, and not kind of pigeonholing him into one spot, just, just letting him be him. Yeah. And it's allowed this defense really to be, it's the best defense that they've had since at least a Marcus where, and you can make the argument, it might be the, their best defense since their Super Bowl years in the early nineties. It just, wow. he has allowed them to, to just change so many things 
about there, there's just there was a long time with the Cowboys where um, you know you you spend all this money on offense and the defense is yeah there's a couple key pieces but it's a lot of try hard uh, you know you try to be an overachieving defense and now with Micah it just changes everything to where uh, you know you have multiple guys on the field that opposing offenses fear. And so because of that, it just it's been interesting to watch Mike McCarthy, Kellen Moore have to kind of tweak that game plan uh, because it's like, hold on, let's just take care of the football. Because if we do, this defense can win us ball games. Now, that was a lot easier said and done with Cooper Rush because he's a backup quarterback. And that's the big question down here is, will that, will that offense change because of the defense since Dak's been out? Or is it going to go back to the way that Dak was before where he was throwing the ball? I just don't see that happening. I think that they're going to lean on this defense a lot more. It's going to be about taking care of the ball, which Dak's been good at. He only had 10 10 interceptions last year. Um, So I think that that's going to be the key there because as long as you can allow this defense to to get rest and and have to defend long fields, uh, they're in good shape. And again, I'm I'm speaking with John Machado, who does a great job covering the Cowboys from uh, the, for the Athletic. And it, it, John, how great is that matchup going to be? You know, you look at Detroit and some of their strengths, and obviously the first thing you look at is that offensive line. They've only allowed you know seven sacks all year. You know, had a few mishaps. You know, against the Patriots, wasn't a, a, a kind of performance that we're used to seeing from those guys up front, but. Through the course of the year, they've been really, really good. Is, is that to you the key matchup in this one? Is is if Detroit can contain or at least slow down Micah and that defensive front a little bit? Is that is that one of the big matchups for you? Yeah, there's no question about that. Um, I just the way when I, you look at these two matchups, you I think that everybody knows that the Lions will be able to score uh, against pretty much anybody. Their offense has been has been impressive all year. It's on the other side of the ball. Will they be able to stop Dak and those guys? But yeah, if if they can slow down Micah and and score points, I think that that's got to be, you know, where you, the the biggest thing really is is to run the ball because that's where their their biggest weakness has been on this Cowboys defense is just the fact that there's been times where they just haven't been able to stop the run. Like two years ago was probably the worst run defense in Cowboys history. And so since Dan Quinn's taken over, they've slowly gotten better, slowly gotten better, but it's still... I mean, you look against the Eagles, that was a weakness there. Of course, the, the Lions don't have a running quarterback like Jalen Hurts, but still, uh, with the way that the Lions run the ball, um, what'll be interesting to watch for in this game is the Eagles did some things where they they designed plays where they went right at Micah, and so that prevents him from kind of being the guy in the backside to run down a play and use his great athleticism. So I'm interested to see if maybe the Lions do that. They run some things that they go right at Micah um, so that he can't come off the backside and, and wreck a play, but if the Lions can run the ball well uh, against this this defense, they should be able to control the clock and, and keep themselves in the game. But what the what the Cowboys want is they want the Lions to get down and have to pass, so you can have Demarcus Lawrence and Micah Parsons and Torrance Armstrong and these guys pin their ears back and be able to go after Jared Goff. Yeah, you're right. And, and Detroit has been really good running the football, and that's the, the staple of of Ben Johnson's and and Dan Campbell. That's what they want to do, um, and they're stubborn with it. You know, even if if Dallas is pretty good early on, I mean, they're going to continue to run it. And, and I guess the big thing here is is and what those guys have talked about, and what Jared Goff talked about, is just being really good on first and second down, and, and not allowing, um, you know. Dallas to put Detroit into some third and sevens, some down in distances where, like you mentioned, they can pin their ears back and go. So, you know, I think one of the big keys is going to be, you know, how well Detroit can be on first and second down, keep on schedule and and not put themselves in bad situations where those guys can pin their ears back. All right, John, the Dallas Cowboys go to five and two on the year. If what happens on Sunday, if they can stop the run, that'll be huge. Um, and then they have to take care of the ball. I don't see that being an issue because I don't think Dak coming back on his first game is going to be attempting a lot of, you know, risky throws, you know, stuff into double coverage. I just don't think that he's going to need to do that. And so as long as they take care of the ball and don't turn it over and they can, they don't have to completely stop the Lions run game because I don't think that anybody's going to do that with that offensive line in those backs. But as long as they can uh, keep them from wrecking the game and having some huge day where, you know, they go for a couple hundred yards and, and a few touchdowns. So as long as they can do those two things, I, I think the Cowboys will be fine. The other thing is that they're coming off a game against the Eagles where they missed 10 tackles. And that's very uncharacteristic of this defense. And I just think you're going to see a, a motivated bunch for this game just because of the sour taste in their mouth leaving Philadelphia Sunday night, but then also 
you know, watching film and doing some of their lookbacks this week on that game. You can just tell from talking to some of the players in the locker room, Dan Quinn, uh, they're not happy with that, that aspect of the game where they've been pretty good. So I don't anticipate them having two bad games in that area. Yeah, it's definitely going to be a motivated bunch here in Detroit coming off a of bye. Obviously, we're beat 29 nothing in New England, so they had that bad taste going into the bye. And so, look, at, during the bye, you, you kind of do that self-evaluation. You, you look at yourself, right, and, and you change some things. So Dallas can probably expect some things they haven't seen on film from Detroit. Uh, Detroit needs a win at 1-4, and four, you know, to, to keep this thing alive and, and, and be relevant in November and December. So it should be a good matchup. Two motivated teams, obviously, NFC matchup. Uh, Dan Campbell gets to go back to Texas. I know he's looking forward to that. John, thanks so much for joining me. Great insight there, and we'll see you on uh, Sunday. I'll make sure to stop by and say hello. Yeah, absolutely do that. And thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Welcome back to the 20 Men in the Huddle podcast presented by Microsoft. And I am with Pro Bowl Center, Frank Rag now. Frank, thanks for joining me. Um, this week, obviously, a huge test with Dallas, and and you look at them and, and that defensive front, and and just what what jumps out about them when you watch them on film? Well, first eleven, uh, Micah Parsons, he is a very dynamic player that kind of can play all over that front seven. They'll put him over the center, the guard, the tackle. They'll put him off the ball, linebacker. And then secondly, they've got Dan Quinn's defense, which is just kind of like old Seattle, old when he was at Atlanta, aggressive, a lot of movement, all kinds of stuff being thrown at you. So it's definitely going to be a great test for us for sure. But you guys got to like the matchup, right? I mean, you, you guys have been playing well all year long. I mean, seven sacks allowed, that's tops in the NFL. You're facing a team in, in Dallas, they've got 24. That leads the emphasis. So it's really strength on strength. But you guys have to go into this one and – feel pretty good about about this matchup just with how well you guys have played the the, f the first five weeks of the season yeah yeah we're always confident and it'll be awesome because it's it's good on, like you said it's good on good and it's you want to play the best and you want to be the best so it's it'll be cool to compete against these guys and prove it that we can keep going no matter who we're going against for sure I know you've been dealing with a little bit of a foot injury did that bye week come at a good time for you to, to get that week off and kind of rest I know you didn't do much on the bye yeah. I just hung out huh yeah it was a huge like usually as a player I'm thinking I'd like to buy a leak a little bit later in the Eight, season, nine, right? Ten, like mid-season, break but, in half, right? But the timing of that was huge for me. Yeah. Uh, I'm very, very grateful for it. For you feel sure. good? Yeah, I feel a lot better. You know, I want to talk about another guy too, Penne, in his, in his second season. Obviously, Deck's been doing it at a high level for a long time. You've been to Pro Bowl. You've been doing it. Um, you know, Jack's been. At, at a Pro Bowl, but Penny is, is that guy to me that that's really come on in his second year. What is it about Penny that's made him so good in, in his second season? He's a freak show with <laughs> with, but there's a lot of freak shows in this league, right. right? He's a freak show with instincts, like football instincts, and he's a freak show with that work ethic. And you combine all three of those, and that's what you guys are seeing. I mean, he does everything the right way. Um, he takes a lot of pride in how he does, uh, how he works his craft, and how he does everything. And you combine all that, and it's pretty special. And that's, I mean, he's going to be a special football player for a long, long time. And if people talk about his athleticism, what does that mean when you're talking about an athlete along the offensive line, and especially a tackle? Like when he, when they say he's one of the most athletic tackles in football, like how does that manifest itself in the game on film? Like how how do you how do you notice that? How do you see that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the way he can run for being whatever he weighs he's a big big man yeah. right and then but also like the way dudes bend I think that's one thing that like you can see where there's some freak shows like the way you can bend and get low and move guys and his feet are just it's hard to describe we always talk about that with defensive ends right like mm -hmm. how guys can bend the Miles Garrett's the Bosa's all uh -huh. those guys how they can bend and, and get low and, and use leverage right to have an offensive tackle that can do that and counteract that, is, is that kind of what you, what, you, what you mean by that? Yeah, to be able to block those dudes on the edge, like you said, they're able to bend and stuff like that. Him and him and Taylor, their, their feet and the way they can move and bend, it's special. It, it's really nice to have kind of bookend tackles. No doubt. No I mean, doubt. Just what does that do for you guys offensively, not only the run game and protection, but just but, uh, the entirety of the offense, just to have two guys that you can count on on the end, what does that mean for an offense? I think it's huge. I think it's huge, especially for the, the quarterback position. Like, for Jared, like, 
I'm sure he's got to feel pretty confident knowing he's got those two guys because that you got two bookends where you're like, hey, we don't need to adjust game plans for them because they're really those kind of guys. It's a, it can change your offense. New England was an anomaly for you guys. We're hoping. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, offensively, we're, what was? We're on to the next. It was, uh, it was just. We just could. We just didn't. We moved the ball. Like yeah. We moved the ball up and field up the field, but we didn't convert on third and fourth down. And then when we got in the red zone, we stalled out. And that's, it's an anomaly. Okay, that's good to hear. Yeah, you guys. I know yeah. they want to hear that. No doubt. No <laughs> that's doubt. Exactly. Um, Hank Fraley, just how great of a of a calming effect does he have in that room? It seems like he's a great teacher because it doesn't matter who you guys plug in. You guys have dealt with some injuries, mm-hmm. right, with Jonah and some of those guys. But but a guy like Evan comes in and 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 is just fine. You know, Skip comes in and and, and plays well. It just seems like whatever you guys kind of do up there, it, it seems to work. How much is that? Hank kind of gluing it all together. It's a lot, Hank. Um, he's a great, like you said, he's a great teacher, man. And uh, it helps that he played the game because um, he really relates that to how we see it. And he's, uh, it's a two way communication, if that makes sense. Like it's not just him telling us, it's an open dialogue. And we're able to work through a lot of things and get to the where we're all comfortable with it. And then the way he prepares guys, like he doesn't just prepare the first five, he's preparing everybody like they could potentially be the starter. And uh, I think also you have to give a little hats off to the whole room because guys have took an onus on that and they believe that. Like they believe they, any day they can be out there. And we've, we've had guys like Skip, like Evan, that have been preparing to be the starter. And then when they step in, it's not you're not noticing a big letdown, you know. It seems like you guys are pretty friendly too. I mean, is that a, is that a pretty close group? I mean, you saw some of it yeah. on Hard Knocks, how you guys are just kind of sitting around and chatting. No, but uh, we see you guys in the locker room and you're messing with each other. And yeah. I know you guys do dinners and stuff yeah. like that. I mean, is, is it a pretty close-knit group? Yeah, we got, a, we got a good crew, man. I mean, me and Decker have been together for now five years with Hank, which is a which yeah. is huge, right? Right. And then Jonah's been here three. And then Panay, it's, it's been good, man. It's been good. The bye week, what was the big focus for you guys coming out of the, of the bye? We mentioned, obviously, health-wise, getting getting you, you guys right, getting getting the foot good. But just from an offensive perspective, maybe a, a bigger picture, what, what was the big message, mm-hmm. you know, coming back out of the bye, what you guys need to do to, you know, be a little bit better on third down, you know, some of the short yep. area stuff, red zone. I mean, what, 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 was the, what was the big talking points, I guess? Yeah, you nailed it there. I think third down – and then especially up front, uh, the short yardage, yeah. right? Like we've got a group that we should be expected to be able to convert on short yardage. And it's been a lot of it's just been guys, all of us really have been trying to do too much, right? We mm. just got to be ourselves and everything will take care of itself. And uh, th- But really those two have been the main focus. Is that tough sometimes though when you're losing – you know that you maybe try to put too much. You maybe try to go outside yourself a little bit. Try to make that mm-hmm. extra play. And coaches talk about it all the time. Well, sometimes that's that's the worst thing you can yeah. do is is just be yourself. Just do your job and count on the next uh, on the guy next to you to do his. Yeah, you can't be pressing. Can't be pressing like that. We don't need heroes. We just need everybody to do their job, and then it'll all work out. All right, I had Taylor Decker on the podcast, um, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago. We were talking about uh, the, the Grizzly man. He had the gear. I think he was wearing one of the, one of your hats. Yeah. He threw it out there that you made the offensive lineman pay for the Grizzly man gear. That that that. <laughs> I, I just I had to that, ask that you about actually, it. That isn't true. <laughs> uh, the original ones, right? So I originally made like ten hats, and they offered. To pay for it, <laughs> okay, right? See, so see, they Deck made it. To pay for Deck it. was made it like. Yeah, I know. Like... That's what Taylor does, and then <laughs> so then a couple guys offer to pay for. It. I'm like, oh, okay, thank you for supporting it. Yeah, it's me and my brother, and then you know he gives me the crap for it. But then I've given him a bunch of free hats. Since, he did so. say that. Yeah, that this stuff afterward has been yeah. free. So obviously the grizzly grizzly man stuff has taken off. I know me. I like to fish, so me and you will chat every mm-hmm. now and again. Uh, you got a place now on on Lake St. Clair that you can go out kind of any time you want now. But I want to talk about your foundation a mm-hmm. little bit too and just tell the folks you know what the foundation is why you started it why it's important to you yeah so it's the rags remembered foundation it's in honor of my uh, late father um he uh, passed away with a heart attack uh, my junior year of college i mean i'm sure a lot of people know the story i'm pretty open about it but uh i'm just incredibly grateful for the way i raised i was raised and i've always wanted to do a foundation that kind of uh i just feel like it's like twofold right like i'm just I feel like being raised the way I was raised where I was, it was kind of like go outside 
and we'll see you for dinner, right? Like, right. I'm calling you for dinner at five o'clock. Mom's yelling at us. Dad's when it starts to get us. dark, you come home. Yeah, exactly. Like it was that kind of childhood. Yeah, yeah you yeah. live in the country. Uh-huh. It was the same childhood that I had. And I think it's good for you, man. So I think, and then on flip side, when my dad did pass away, I uh, I turned to the outdoors to grieve. And uh, so I thought about this foundation to kind of honor my dad where we could really get grieving families in the outdoors and help disadvantaged youth or anybody really just get to the outdoors. Because I, I think it can be beneficial just in general, but really beneficial to help you grieve. It's just another out, outlet, hopefully. And you had, I think your first um, your first event was mm-hmm. over the summer, right? Yep. How'd that go? It was really good. We raised 50 grand nice. to start off, which was incredible. Uh, it was a good turnout. And then we've actually got one coming up here. I don't know when this comes out, but it's coming up on November 7th. Oh, yeah. No, yep. this will be out, yeah, before that. So that's perfect. Yeah, it'll be at Ford Field. So uh, it was, What are you guys doing there? It's just a, it's a red tie event. Okay. So, yeah, oh, just another fundraiser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, not really my scene, but whatever we got to do to help, hey, dude, help the kids. Help yeah, kids, exactly. Right? Uh-huh. So... I, I know you're an avid fisherman, avid hunter. Um, where's a great place on Lake St. Clair to catch smallies? You know, some good ones. Oh, I'm not going to give you. I'm not going to give you any. I'll give you spots that I'll give you a spot that every in front of the old Ford Estate. Okay. That uh, yeah. Uh, like uh, there's a launch right there on Jefferson. It's like nine mile, but right now in front of the Fort, old Ford Estate, in uh, the spring, juicy. That that's where they're a lot at. of structure there. Yeah, very good. That's awesome. Well, great job with the foundation. Thank that, you. That, that's awesome. I appreciate you know, it. I, I don't think people realize just how much fun it can be to be out, you know, fishing, mm-hmm. hunting, doing all that stuff. If you haven't done it before, just how relaxing. And, and it, it can take your mind. Mm-hmm. Oh, stuff. for just sure. Going out, I'm, I'm sure, like, you know, a night after a rough game or whatever on a Tuesday when you have a day off, just how relaxing is that to throw out there on a yeah. Tuesday and, and just go fish for a little turn while. Turn everything off and just relax. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, you need to turn it up no uh, this Sunday because we need to get we need to get a win. That offense needs to get rolling, and, and you guys got to uh, have a tough task, obviously, but but you seem pretty confident, Bunch, that you can turn this thing around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Confident in our guys. All right. Well, let's do it. Yep. Frank Ragnall, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. It is now time for the key matchups presented by BetMGM, and I have Michael O'Hara with me. Thanks for joining me again, Mike. Uh, the pleasure is mine. I just want to tell you one we thing. We had you on a couple weeks ago, and the numbers went so through the roof with people wanting Mike O'Hara content that I just had to have you right back on again. Did you recognize that I called you a couple hundred times? <laughs> but it was the only thing I, I was so ready to, to do. I had five notebooks with me. I cut it down to five sheets of paper, okay? There's going to be pretty five really... <laughs> Really uh, intuitive sheets of paper, though. Wait a minute, this one's upside down. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start with the key matchups. Sure. And, and obviously, this is a huge game, Mike. Detroit's offensive line versus Dallas's defensive front. I mean, they lead the, lay, the league with 24 sacks. Detroit is tied for the lead with the fewest allowed at seven. And so, you know, I look at probably who's been the most consistent performer up front for Detroit and who's been the best performer on that defense for Dallas is Penny Sewell versus Mike, Micah Parsons. Yeah, I don't know if they'll go head to head or how much they will, but you know, that's something you'd really want to really want to look at. You know, I was thinking about about Penny Sewell, uh, Tim, and one of the things that kind of struck struck me is there'll be three or four or five games or whatever we're into the season, and I won't even remember him, and that's a good thing right. because you don't hear holding fifty eight. I think is the one he gets his the false start. Yeah, and, it, and usually it's the second or third play of the game. But but aside from that, this guy's as, as as steady as they come. And I don't mean just steady, but but powerful the whole the entire package. Yeah, kind of interesting that these two guys came out of the same draft and two of the better players in that draft. Yeah, you know it would be interesting if you went and redraft oh. twenty twenty one. That was where Trevor Lawrence went number one. Obviously there was the run on the quarterbacks, but I think between Trevor Lawrence, Jamar Chase, Penny Sewell, and Micah Parsons. That's probably your top four picks in a redraft. Well, there wouldn't be anybody after that that I would take ahead of Penny Sewell. I yeah. really wouldn't. Whoever was on the board then, I like Penny Sewell. I liked him then. I like him now. And you look at look at Parsons. I mean, he's been so explosive for them. And look, he can play the stack spot. He can play outside linebacker. They'll put him on the defensive line. He can rush from every. He leads that team with six. Um, six sacks on the year. Uh, the, as a team, I mentioned they got 24 sacks. They've got four games where they have at least 15 quarterback pressures. And 
Um, you know, Parsons got three multi-sack games. I mean, he is a wrecker. And so I don't know how often we'll see Penny Sewell and him just because of, like you mentioned, they move him around so often. But when that's a matchup, that's going to be a really fun Yeah, that's so keep that video out there, folks. If you tape the games or what record it, keep it. It's, it's one to watch. Penny Sewell, one half sack allowed in five games. He's been really, really good. What happened to the other half a sack? <laughs> <laughs> All right. the guy he pointed at on the wall. <laughs> Let's flip, the, flip the other side of it and, and go – you know, Detroit's defensive front um, against Dak Prescott, who all indications out of Dallas are, you know, that thumb, he, he returned to practice this week. Thumb's getting better. He's probably in line to make a start, his first start since week one. Um, you know, credit Cooper um, Cooper Rush for, you know, holding down the fort. That's a 4-2 and two football team um, that's still in it, getting their, their starting quarterback back. But to me, that's a, that's a big one because this Detroit Lions – defense has to generate more pressure. They just have to. I mean, they are last in the league in sacks, and they just don't affect the quarterback enough. And I don't know if Dak will be a little bit rusty maybe. Uh, you know, he's a veteran guy, but when you haven't played in, in over a month, there could be some rust there. And, and so to get after him early in that game, to make him uncomfortable early, just don't let him settle in. And I think – Aiden's just got to be a big part of that. You know, he was the number two pick for a reason. He had one really good half against Washington. He's had three sacks. Not a lot of production in the other games. I think this is kind of one he, he's he got to, you know, he, he was able to self-scout himself, look in the mirror during the bye week, probably came up with some things, and, and he's got to be part of the solution for this Detroit Lions defense to be better. Well, I kind of took it personally when you said veteran guys get rusty because <laughs> I fall into both of those categories. If I'm Aiden Hutchinson, I guess this is kind of funny, though, but I'd sort of use a little bit of psychology, and I'd go up to Dak Prescott before the game, and I'd say, look, Treat this like it's your first game of the season. Because the first game of the season, he went 14 for 29, no touchdowns, one interception, and a passer rating of 40-something. So just pretend it's the opening day. Okay? It's the opening day. That's the way to work on him. But really, his own game, look, he's played five games, and he had a chance, like you said, uh, Tim, to, to reflect on what he what he did, just with no pressure on him, no, not, no nothing, just look at his game. And I think he's, a, from all accounts, a pretty smart young man. And, you know, he's had a great college career. He's played a lot of ball, but it just hasn't quite fired for him yet, except for that one half in the second game of the season. But come up with something, you know, whatever it is, something that they haven't seen within the framework of your, of your, your defensive structure and, and make them think the rest of the game that, hey, he's coming. And finish. Finish. I think he's been in positions to make some plays. You look at even, you know, in New, New England against Bailey yep, Zappi. Absolutely. Had him had in the backfield right there. Had Jalen Hurts week one a couple times. Got his hand out, wasn't able to finish. Look, Dak can move around a little bit. And, you know, I, I think he he moves to throw. I don't think he's a traditional runner like a Jalen no. Hurts. But if you've got that opportunity, he's elusive enough to make you miss. I think that's probably the big word for, for Hutch over the bye was finish. Yeah, and one of the, one of the defensive linemen, I was went, went on their website to listen to their quotes after the game uh, Sunday night, and he said, we've got four back. So that's how much they believe in, in him in, in Dallas, and they should. Yeah. I don't know what, they were 12-4 and four last year and, and, you know, really going good, probably should have won a playoff game, kind of diddled it away. But, but yeah, that, that, that's, that's their guy. That's, that's, the, that's their quarterback, the quarterback. All right, we've looked at the, at the trenches now to start. Let, let's go outside a little bit. And, and a key one, another key one for me is Josh Reynolds. Now we'll see if, if, if Josh plays. I know he's been banged up a little bit, missed some practice this week. Um, but it'll be Josh or whoever that deep threat is for Detroit because going against Trayvon Diggs, a really talented quarter, he's going to be the guy on the outside that, that's trying to shut down whoever Dallas perceives as Detroit's biggest threat on the outside, their deep threat. And when you look at this um, matchup, uh, Dallas has played pretty good all, all year long. Eight touchdowns allowed by the Cowboys at second fewest in the NFL, and they're fourth against the pass. They're only allowing 183.5 yards per game. So, look, Trayvon obviously had the huge season last year, isn't having you know the greatest that much impact early this season, but he's their guy, and, and Detroit's got to find a counter, whether that's Josh Reynolds, whether that's DJ Chark, I don't think he's going to be back this week, whoever it is, um, look, Josh has led them um, in receiving all year. He's been a really reliable weapon. I think he's got to be for them this week as well. Well, yeah, and I think I've looked this up. He's had, in the last three games, he's had 19 catches, 269 yards, something like that, so one thing about, about Diggs, look, he can 
you know, he, he had the 11 interceptions last year, and he's got two so far. So he's really on course to have, you know, six interceptions. But they're probably not throwing at him as much. I mean, look, why would you keep throwing it to it when, when the cornerback has as good a chance of coming down with it as your intended receiver? So that's probably a function of, of just being good. And, and not that he's got a drop off in performance, just in, in the numbers themselves may not add up the same way, but he's a really, really good ball player. He's tied for the NFL lead with nine pass breakups as well. So, look, he gets his hands on footballs, sure. but he takes some chances too. Among those 11 interceptions last year, four touchdowns allowed. Through six games, he's allowed two. So, look, they're going to target him a little bit, you know, obviously down the field. Um, but he's. He can give up some plays, too, because he's always trying to make that big play, go for that pass defense, go for that interception. Sometimes you can you know, sneak a ball by him because he's a little bit aggressive. Maybe you can double move him while he tries you know, to, 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 get, to get those picks in big plays. So maybe an opportunity there th- through film study that you know, they can maybe set him up and try to do something deep. Yeah, and Josh Reynolds is you know, he's a pretty, pretty 6'3", 6'4", something like that, good range, you know, good hands and, and long arms and all that. And he's really shown an ability to get downfield and come down with the ball. So look, you talk about a guy who the Lions just sort of just picked him up last year and he had a connection with, with, with Jared Goff and, and with the Los Angeles Rams. They carried that forward and he's really been an, an important player for the Detroit Lions. Who has also been an important player on a defense that obviously looks to turn things around is Jeff Okuda, Lions cornerback, and he's going to have He's going to have his hands full with C.D. Lamb this week. I think that's a really intriguing matchup. You know, Dak likes to go down the field, and when he does, it, it, it's usually, you know, C.D. That's their big play guy. Um, Jeff Okuda, no touchdowns allowed, but the penalties are creeping up a little bit. Obviously, had two big ones yeah. um, in New England. I think he had one the week before. That was a pretty critical play, too. I think we joked, you know, coming in that, well, you know, you got to be there to cover a guy to get a penalty, right? right? You got to be running right with him. You got to, you know, be in that position. Um, so that's a good thing that you know you're not trailing a guy. You can't get a pass interference five yards behind a guy. So he's right there. Just probably some technique stuff he needs to work on. But the no touchdowns allowed. He's he's probably been one of their better players on defense. No, I would agree season. with that too. And I'm say the same thing about him that we said about Penny Sewell about redrafting and all that. He was. You know, he was taken third overall in the draft out of out of Ohio State. We're talking uh, we're talking about Okuda, and you go back and look at like, the next f- fifteen or eighteen picks, and there's nobody that you would go, okay, I'd rather have him than than than, uh, than, Jeff. than Jeff Okuda. So I I think the injuries are what held him back for two years, but now I think we're starting to see why they took him, where they took him, and I think he's validating that pick. CD Lamb, thirty three catches, four hundred nine yards, a couple touchdowns. He's their big play guy. He's caught 14 passes of 15-plus yards on the year. That's tied for the fifth most in the league. So when they go downfield, it's usually C.D. He's also their big drop guy, too. Now, you can't count on a guy dropping the ball when he's wide open, but he does do that. In other words, you can sit there and just, please drop another one. (laughs) (laughs) All right, my final matchup. We talked about Aiden. Let's let's go on the other side, and, and we'll see if that's Charles Harris. I know he missed some practice time this week. John Kaminsky returned to practice. So, you know, it's going to be a combination of either those two or, or some of the other guys they have against Tyler Smith, their rookie from Tulsa. Uh, you know, a guy who was pressed into action because uh, of an injury ahead of him. And, look, he, he hasn't been too bad. For, for a rookie starting at left tackle um, in that division particularly, I mean, with some of the defensive lines in, in – in, in the East, I mean, three sacks in six games. I mean, if, if, if you were going to tell me ahead of the season I'm starting a rookie left tackle through six games, I'd probably take three sacks. He hasn't been bad, but there's going to be some opportunity there, two needs there because he is a rookie, right, Mike? Well, you would think so. I and mean, look, he's replacing Tyron Smith, a 12-year player, probably, I mean, at least, at the very least, a borderline Hall of Fame yeah, uh, a sure. defensive lineman. Maybe not quite there, you know. He's probably had a career similar to here in Detroit, like Lomas Brown, just a really good, you know, perennial All-Pro. Or I'm sorry, perennial Pro Bowl player. And we'll see. I I, I would think that it, if if it's if it's Hutchinson lines up, or then it's rookie versus rookie. And so I don't know if there really is an advantage there. So this would be for to me a guy like Charles Harris if he can play with the quickness he has, the speed around the corner. I think this would be a good setup for him now. Yeah, you've got to do it. It's easy for me to sit here and talk about it and say, yeah, if you do this, that, and the other thing, you'll get the quarterback, but you've got to do it. And that's been one of the issues with the Detroit Lions. Probably one of their biggest issues so far in the first five games is not getting to the quarterback. Seven. Seven. Seven Three of them in one half. Three of them in one half. Seven sacks last in the NFL. 
So, you know, you, you just look at the, the, the Dallas and, and how productive they've been at 24. Detroit at the bottom of the list was seven. I mean, what a big difference. It just goes to show. And you look at the defensive statistics that support each of those teams, too, and you can see why Dallas is among one of the best defenses in the league, why Detroit is it. Pass rush is huge. And you can see why a guy like, you know, Diggs got 11 interceptions last year because quarterbacks are forced to get rid of the ball probably before they want to, before they see what they really want to see. And, and that that's part of the game. Make the quarterback, make him uncomfortable, make him throw the ball when he doesn't want to throw it. Lions haven't done that enough. But look, they, they've had their, their bye week. They've had their, you know, to, to rest up and all that and maybe study their own game, you know, and develop what themselves what they need to develop and now putting it on the practice field as we talk. And then apply it on Sunday. Apply it on Sunday. It's apply, a big game, isn't apply it? Apply it in a hard way, too. <laughs> apply it in a hard way. He is Mike O'Hara. Those are the M- Bet MGM key matchups. You know, obviously, we, we covered a lot of stuff this week. Mike, PJ Clark will, will, will join me Sunday night in Dallas. We'll break down the game, too. It's a big one. PJ's the one who got my seat on the plane. <laughs> <laughs>